Sean, another episode of AMA. This has become a regular, uh, regular occurrence, I think, maybe. It is. People are going to be sick of us. I want <laughs> Ryan back. Bring Ryan back, please. Give me Ryan. I want Ryan. You know, whatever. <laughs> you want Ryan? I think he's in, where is he, in California? LA, yeah, he's out LA. on his way out towards me. LA area. So, um, so uh, you you are getting Sean and I for uh, today's episode of the AMA. We'll be fielding questions, obviously from Facebook, uh, a couple from Facebook, but mostly from the gentleman of the Iron Council, uh, which is our exclusive brotherhood. To learn more about the IC, you can go to orderman.com/slash Iron Council. It is not open. And so uh, my suggestion, anyone interested in the Iron Council, sign up for the newsletter, follow Mr. Mickler on Instagram or Twitter um, at Ryan Mickler uh, to stay up to date. Uh, and then once uh, we open for a new cohort uh, in the IC, which is probably early March, uh, then you'll have a short window to sign up and, and join the next group of guys, the next wave of guys uh, to join the Iron Council. So, and it's good, it's fun. I like this wave approach because it's like, we just get flooded with all these guys ready to hit the ground, uh, getting after it, um, you know, really at the beginning of the month of March. So uh, it's gonna be cool to see all these guys kind of get on battle teams and, and whatnot. Anyhow, you were saying, Sean, you're a little under the weather. So you might have a little bit of the sniffles, but, and you're talking about potentially moving, but I have to ask, ask this question because I, I was following you on Instagram and you surf and you've like <laughs> surfed for a really long time. Uh, and how's that going to work out potentially moving away from California? Cause I'm assuming surfing is a big part of your life. Yeah. Just travel. It's a huge part. Um, yeah. always is. I'd never in a million years thought I'd be leaving California. Like if you asked me even a year ago, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's changed dramatically. We'll just travel though. We'll travel. We'll buy a place in Hawaii. For it. Um, yeah. Just the difference of state income tax between California and Tennessee is zero. <laughs> just that alone will You'll allow us to travel buy a place. and still save money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one of these times I'm going to have to take you up on, um, get some surfing lessons. I I've been surfing a handful of times. Um, but I've never like been like, like Asia has taught me what she knows, you know what I mean? But it's like beginner teaching a beginner. Yeah. Um, but for me, man, I just, the ocean makes me super nervous. And so I, I think my nerves probably get in my head more than anything else. And, and maybe I just, That's a lot of people, a lot of people are really afraid of not being able to see what's under you and around you. It yeah. Really yeah. Or out. just comfortable in the water. Right. Like I, in fact, I, I actually, probably will do this later this year. Um, sounds silly, but I, I think my swimming is not very good. Mm. Um, and, uh, probably before the end of the year, I'm going to sign up and actually get coached on swimming <laughs> I, uh, legit. Like I'm going to hire a coach and I'm going to become a good swimmer, uh, just yeah. because it's a, an area that I'm uncomfortable with, you know, and I, I do okay. Like I don't drown obviously, but I, I just, I don't, I don't have confidence in my ability to swim well. So the biggest thing that fails people is the ability to relax. It's even less the swimming and more just kind of to relax yourself, let yourself get pushed around and, you know, to let it kind of run its course and then, you know, calmly make your way to the surface. And that's, yeah. uh, yeah, that's a large part of the battle. I use this story. Um, I use this story all the time at work. Uh, and we, we talk about, uh, I'm in the space where I, I consider myself a specialist in the space of knowledge management and information architecture. And, and that includes how we disseminate information. And um, the analogy that I use often is, and a lot of companies get this wrong, is what they'll do is they'll say, hey, th there's this important set of information that I need to make sure all the employees know. Whether they need it right now or not, we'll blast them with this kind of this email. And then we'll expect them to like retain it for when they might need it. You know what I mean? Which is highly inefficient. And that's not how humans work, right? We need the information when we need the information, not, you know, 10 years earlier, right? And, and, and this is also the problem with our universities because they approach it from the perspective of regurgitating data, um, which is really the lowest level of understanding. Uh, and then you graduate and then you're supposed to like somehow be able to reference some data that you didn't fully comprehend and you didn't act upon. 
uh, in from a heuristic perspective and just mm. come off memory and it's supposed to going to like help you. But anyhow, the, the, the story that I use is my first time surfing. I was with my wife and, um, and we were newlyweds. It was actually on our honeymoon. And, uh, so there's a little bit of like, uh, I was checking my ego or I wasn't checking my ego this a little bit. She's like, fast. Hey, let's go surfing. And I'm like scared shitless. And these waves are kind of big and I'm like, I'm going to die, but I don't want to tell her I'm going to die. Right. Cause I got to be this tough guy. And so, so we're just surfing and, and we get ready and she goes, Oh, I almost forgot a quick tip. And I'm like, Oh, what is it? She's like, if you get disoriented in the water, uh, just reach down and grab the leash and follow it to the board. And I was like, okay, like what would have happened if she didn't tell me that? And, and within the hour, no joke, I got eaten, eaten by a, a wave and I was, I was panicking underwater and I was like swimming, like panicking to, to swim the surface. And then I remember what she told me and I reached out and grabbed the leash and the board was the opposite direction as swimming. I was like swimming mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. not up. And I thought, oh my gosh, I like would have completely died, <laughs> right? If she did tell me that, or maybe I would have, I don't know. But nonetheless, like that's the example of corporate America. If that was corporate America, that would have been an email I, earlier in the year saying, hey, anyone happen to go surfing, remember to do this. And I would have deleted the email because I'm like, well, I'm not surfing right now. And then yeah. I would have died, right? Versus just in time information. So, but um, I don't know where I'm going with this. I need coaching, Sean. I'm going to ping you. <laughs> Even if you don't live in California, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll hire you to, to meet me in, in Hawaii or, or California to give me some teaching. So I love it. I've, I've probably taught easily over a hundred people to surf, you know, taking them out there. And it's, it's, I love doing that. It's more fun than going out by myself sometimes. Yeah. All right. Well, we, we got it publicly announced. That's why I actually brought this up after we hit record, just so you're, you're held accountable for locked uh, in. your word here. So, <laughs> um, all right. So let's grab a couple of questions from Facebook, uh, guys to join us on Facebook. If you haven't already, that's facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Our first question, Cameron Miller, I'm active duty military and I've decided not to get the vaccine. The future is uncertain. So should I start reaching out to potential future employers in case I get discharged? How should I go about contacting them? Is it weird since I'm still employed and not actively looking for a job? Thanks, guys. I don't think it's weird at all. I think no. it's prudent. I think it, it makes the most sense. And, uh, you know, this, this we could be talking about anything. And this stops most guys from success in most things that they do. and. Um, you know, I, I the think, reaching uh, out to people, the reaching out. Yeah. And, and the most recent thing I can think of is I have, um, uh, this group in my business of men that, you know, it's kind of, it's, I don't want to say it's like the IC cause it's nowhere as good or as much value, but it's, we have this men's group in our business, at least to be in touch with all the men and, and kind of helping them out with things. And this month I'm having them read sovereignty. And we're going through the book and, and I told him, I'm like, Hey, if anybody's struggling financially and you, you know, you don't want anybody to know, just reach out to me uh, individually, send me a DM, let me know you need the book. I'll send you one. You know, I I've given out almost 200 of, of Ryan's books, you know, at this point. And, uh, and so I get some messages from some guys and one of them, you know, reaches out and says, you know what, I'm, I, I didn't want to ask. I feel bad asking, but I need it and blah, blah, blah. And my response to him was, you know, I've made millions of dollars asking, right? Yeah. Like what's going to stop most people from getting what they want is that yeah, fear of asking, ask. inconveni inconveniencing somebody, whatever it is. Yeah. And if you don't ask, you're never going to know. And so it's, I, I think that especially if he's looking for a good long-term employer, that's going to, to fit his needs. It's important that he asks now, because if he goes in telling him why he's looking, his current circumstance, his, his feelings about the vaccine and that employer, um, that potential employer knows that now and they want him, then he's covered all of that for future reference in that Ahead job. of time. Yep. Yeah. 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 yeah so sure. I'd say absolutely. You should be putting those feelers out there asking, you know, different people he knows if they're hiring, if they're looking for people and just start getting it out there for sure. Yeah. And I would communicate it, right? Like 
and you've already alluded to that, Sean, it's like, tell these other potential hires, like, hey, I'm in the military. I'm afraid of getting discharged. I don't want to get the vaccine. I'm looking for a company that's not going to force that upon me. Like that's that for some organizations, they might be like, yeah, you're our guy. We're looking yeah. for people that like have an opinion that just don't follow the status quo or, you know what I mean? Toe in line just because of, of some mandate or um, that is willing to like stand up for one's belief, right? Like that could be a positive thing for this particular gentleman. I, and, and Sean, I, I just want to relate like something that you said is like, you've made millions of dollars by asking really just to reiterate that opportunities are always through people. Yeah. <laughs> Growth opportunities in life is through another human. There, there is no like elusive, like Walmart. There's no elusive corporate America that gives you your job. It's actually the person hiring you. It's, it's other individuals. Uh, promotions at work are through people. New jobs are through people. And and far too often, I think we assume, and, and I'm speaking from experience because this is my default. My default is put my head down, bust my ass, and just opportunities will present themselves. Well, I'm realizing like even now in my life, I, I, I consider myself a, a career person. You know, I'm an expert in my field. And even now I'm realizing how much I need to set expectation and ask for what I want. Because a yeah. lot of people just assume like, hey, Kip's happy. He's killing it. Why change anything? And meanwhile, I might have this, um, what's the uh, no more Mr. Guy, nice Guy contract? Uh, oh, you know what I'm talking about. A covert contract. Covert contracts, yeah. Yeah, I might have this quasi-covert contract with my boss or my employer thinking, oh, if I will do this, they're going to do this. But they're zero aware of that expectation. And then I, I'm around running around getting pissed off because my expectations aren't being met. Well, you know, I haven't communicated those expectations with anybody. So, um, and this is hard for me actually, because I, I, I put value in opportunity coming to me without me asking. Like I use it as a, a, a self-esteem thing. Like, oh yeah, like I'm really valued. And I'll even second guess like, well, am I getting that because I asked or is it because they really think I'm, valuable in this area. And, and I've had this conversation with Ryan in the past and he's so different than me because his response to this is like, well, who cares whether they gave it to me because I asked or whether I deserved it. That's how I succeed. You know what I mean? Like I get what I want and I <laughs> proceed. You know what I mean? And I'm like, Oh, I want them to pick me because I'm really valuable. Not because I asked, you know, like I'm, I'm such a, I don't know, emotional wreck compared to compared to Ryan, but he will burn. <laughs> pass or create wakes of destruction in, in his progress. And we've talked about this, like we, we were almost complete opposites, but I realized that, that um, yeah, you got to set those expectations, right? You got to ask and opportunities are always available in other people or through other people, I should say. Yeah. And, and I think the biggest fear people have is that they're going to sound stupid, you know, or that yeah. they're going to feel stupid or whatever. I would say or the meaning that they put on no, would you say as well, Sean? Absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. biggest thing is be as honest as you can, you know, and the more honest, the better, uh, mm -hmm. the more forthcoming, the yeah. better, because you're going to find you're going to land in, a, in more of a position that you want, where if you're not completely clear, and you're not completely honest, you're going to end up in another situation, most likely that you don't want to be in. Yeah, mm, I love it. All right. Uh, Reginald Chrislet Jr. How soon should high school boys and young men be taught the truth about our family court system to protect them and prepare them? Oh, wow. This is interesting. I have, I have some thoughts if you want to give, give some thought to it first, but. Yeah. I mean, my initial thought is instead, why don't we teach them um, clear communication and the things that are going to keep us out of the court system, right? Let's, let's, let's teach them. Totally you know, the, the values and the communication skills to figure things out, to work things out. You know, I know with my kids, I mean, I grew up in a, in a broken home, split, split home. My mom went through three different marriages through raising us. And so, you know, I saw a lot of that. Um, and, uh, and she didn't take advantage of it, which was always interesting to me, you know, where she complained about not getting child support or whatever it was. And 
but she never really pursued it when she could have. And uh, so I was able to see it, but, you know, it was less about that and more about, well, if she, you know, and the, the guys that she was with spent more time just increasing their communication, increasing their relationship, not being stubborn, not, you know, taking things the wrong way when they didn't need to. Um, they would have maybe never been in that spot to begin with. So just that, you know, working on themselves and that personal growth. Um, you know, I, I personally haven't had any conversations with my kids about the court system. Um, you know, and I've, I've two of them are teenagers, two of them are younger. Um, but mine's more about, you know, choosing your partner wisely, communicating well, um, understanding different personalities, um, you know, searching for what people mean when they say things. Uh, because like you and I, you mentioned you and Ryan, right? The way you do things, you and I, same thing. We're different personality types. I could say something and you may think, you know what? I would never say that to Sean that way. And you think I'm a jerk, but my meaning behind it might be good intent, pure. Um, you know, I might even yell at you for something, but for me, that's because I care because I, I'm trying to help you. And if you understand that about my personality, you're not going to take offense. You're not going to um, jump to conclusions, you know, but if you don't, you will. And so I think that personally is more important than teaching about the court system, right? And now I think it's important, like Ryan's doing a lot more work, bringing this stuff to light for guys that they start understanding it or, or looking into it. But I think that's for guys that are kind of past the point of no return. Yeah. Right. And, and so, and it, that's my thoughts. It, it could be very wrong and, and off base, but that's my initial thought. No, nah, it's not wrong. Here's the deal. Default mentality for most kids, actually, what you say default mentality for human nature is to be a victim. Yeah. So I'd be very careful in regards to giving your children or your boys, any ammunition to be a victim. And, and if, it's if you start too early and go, Hey son, the system's against you, right? The court system's against you, you know, society's against you in this particular way and whatever that you run the danger of your kid latching onto it and going, oh yeah. And, and, and being a victim about it. Now, should they be aware for sure? But I, I think it's, it's, I would introduce that conversation with a level of maturity of your, of your, of your boys. Um, my second oldest I never really had the conversation around um, kind of social nuances that I feel are part of the boy crisis and, and that are kind of stacked around men, whether it's the court system or, or a lot of other things, right? I mean, we can say that if you're a white male, it's okay that you are somewhat reverse racist or discriminated against because you're the majority, right? Like there's all these little nuances that actually don't make sense. Shoot, as and, simple as like opening the door for your wife or girlfriend or, you know, like you're not totally. allowed to do that anymore, right? right? Or, yeah, or gender equality. But if we go to war, you'll get drafted and not girls. Like there's, yeah. there's lots of little nuances and you want to be very careful that you don't bring those up too early where your son will latch onto them and, and be a victim of those circumstances. And I like your point, Sean, is teach them how to stay out of the court system, right? How to deal with relationships, how to honor their commitments, how to choose a, a proper spouse. That's way more valuable. Um, and at one point when they're a little bit more mature, I think you can introduce, you know, some of these nuances that they should be aware of, right? Um, it, yeah, so they can be careful, but I, I wouldn't do it too early. Yeah, and, and you see this, I, I think I see it a little more probably in the Facebook group than we do in the IC, but you'll see get a lot of guys ask those sorts of questions like, Hey, I've been with this, you know, I've had this girlfriend for eight years and it's up and down and, you know, things aren't great. And what should I do? And then a lot of the answers are, you know, make sure you get a prenup, make sure you do this. It's like, man, if you go into the relationship with the expectation that there's a good chance that it's going to fail. Yeah. I can tell you, it's probably going to fail. Right. And so, again, sometimes we set ourselves up for disaster uh, by focusing too much on that on the front end instead of, you know, finding the right relationship to begin with. I heard this great quote 
um, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to quote it accurately, but um, it was something to the extent of like, you know, couples always ask the question, is it better? Is it better that we stay married and have contention and fighting all the time or get divorced and have a happy home? Hmm. And the answer is neither. It's better to stay married and get happy and fix things. That's the answer. But far too often we go, oh, it has to be this or this, you know, and it kind of goes back to our mentality, you know, what you're alluding to, Sean. Well, it's work. People are, are looking for the easier route most of the time, right? Yeah, for sure. All right, Jason Todd, this is kind of an interesting question. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts varying, varying subjects, although one thing specifically in the manhood realm is many of those podcasts are based out of Utah. Many of those that are in Utah are of the LDS faith. Faith. What do you attribute to the LDS faith that has such a strong focus on manhood versus other Protestant faiths? Disclaimer, I do understand that you don't speak for all of the LDS church members. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Have you had this impression that, that I, I mean, has? I don't know. I mean, not growing up. I don't up. know if I follow enough podcasts, but, or maybe I just don't know that, uh, that they're LDS. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm the same. I don't really pay attention to whether they are or not, or somebody is or not. Um, I can say not growing up in the church. It's, I definitely see, I think it's less a, a focus on um, manhood as much as focus on the nuclear family. Yeah. Um, and the role that men play, you know, as yeah. opposed to the role that women play, um, you know, but then you, it, I wouldn't say that it's predominantly that over other Protestant um, Christian religions, because like, look at wild at heart, right. With uh, John Eldridge. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. he's not LDS and, and that's Pressfield. one of the best books I've ever read. I don't right? think Pressfield's LDS, is he? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Right? And, I mean, Mansfield? it's just, there, there's, there's, yeah, Mansfield, there's n numerous you know, yeah. authors or whoever else out there. Um, even Dave Ramsey, right? Dave, Dave yeah. with, uh, I mean, look at the stuff that he's teaching. And, and he even said in the podcast with Ryan that um, he looks at what he's doing as ministry, you know, and, and so the foundations of the things that he's talking about are, you know, along those lines as well. And, and so um, most likely this guy is probably just finding people that sound like what he likes and they happen to be LDS, or maybe they're saying some of the same things. Maybe they're quoting scripture more often. Maybe they're, you know, yeah. quoting some of the leaders in, in the church and he, and he finds that more appealing. Yeah. I don't know. Right. It's but, like, but if I, if I like safe. surfing, I'm going to be attracted to more yeah. things that maybe talk about surfing and podcasts and than other things, but I'm going to, I'm going to catch some of that lingo. Some of those things that I understand more than, you know, someone like you who doesn't surf at all. Right. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, the answer to the question though, I, I think it goes back, to, you know, to par paraphrase, um, the family is critical, mm -hmm. uh, to the LDS church. It, it is at the center, um, of that faith. And so you, you can't really have a conversation of the nuclear family and, um, having clarity around your responsibilities without the conversation of manhood being part of the game. So, um, so I, I think it's just really back to what you said. I, I think it's the focus on the family that naturally makes manhood such a critical conversation uh, yeah. within the church. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the plan of salvation is also called the plan of happiness, right? And that yeah. and it includes um, eternal families. I, I mean, that's that's what the plan of salvation is. And so yeah. it's, it's totally. always going to be the focus. Yeah. And I can't help, you know, I was, I was having dinner. Um, with a couple of friends on Friday night and we were talking about just high schools and, you know, some of the BS and things that we're seeing, you know what I mean? Uh, even in our conservative neighborhoods, you know, like a little, little gray kind of coming into our middle schools or our high schools. And, and it was funny because I even jumped on the bandwagon a little bit, like criticizing the school, right. Or like, Oh, the school shouldn't allow this. And blah, blah, blah. And, I, and, and then I paused a second. I go like, actually, that's not the problem. Problems, parents. Problems, family. Uh, we shouldn't need schools to have certain codes of conduct if us as fathers and mothers and parents were doing our job. Yeah. 
right? And, 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 and there's that always that dichotomy of freedom and safety, right? Control and freedom. They're always in conflict with each other. And, and I think sometimes we jump on the bandwagon. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. Controls if it's aligned with my values. It's like, no, actually, you know what? Parents need to step up their game. And, and half the shit that we see in schools that we don't like, it's because of parents yeah. not doing their jobs. And, and, and just reiterates the importance of what we're doing with Order of Man, what we're doing in the Iron Council, the legacy event, the Squire program that Bedros does. These things are so critical. Um, and, and it really starts in the home. Uh, yeah. you, you mess up homes, everything else will go, go to crap. So go to crap. That's a technical term, by the way. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on that? No, no, nailed it. All right. Jefferson Drew Al, uh, Abla. I'm 30 years old, married and have four kids, but I feel like I'm floating through life right now without a destination in sight. Where do I start? when I don't have any dreams or ambitions left in me. So he's kind of like in a little bit of a dark spot, right? Lack mm. some hope. Anything that I've ever wanted to start or have started has been shot down or bashed by significant others and or relatives. And I think that's obviously the key to the question here. Yeah, it, I would say that's normal. First of all, uh, it's a normal that place it would be, to be shot down by significant others and relatives. Um. Yeah, that's a normal part, but just the fact that you feel flat or maybe drifting, um, I think that's a normal thing. Um, and honestly, I think the fact that it's happening to you at 30 um, is, uh, is not a bad thing. Uh, it's just, it, it's, if you can get a handle on it now, though, um, it'll serve you well for the rest of your life and, and uh, you know, kind of the building of your family. But um, I know I've been there before where you just feel like you're going through the motions. Everything's the same, especially with four kids. I have four kids. Um, yeah. And once they get in sports and activities and it's real easy to start feeling like every day is the same, right? It's like groundhog day. And you know, it's like, yeah. okay, wake up, take them to school, do this, drop them off at this, drop it, you know, do this, do this meeting, do right. And if your job is monotonous that way as well, it's real easy to sink into that. And so um, you know, it, you really have to seek something different. And the stuff that getting shot down is a normal part of that process of change. Um, nobody likes change because it's work. And so whether it's significant others, friends, family, I mean, I know for myself when I started my business and I was 22 and single when I started my business and got backlash from family, especially my mom who was super negative, you know, and she was the person I was doing it for who I wanted yeah, to provide trying for. to get some approval for too. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that made it difficult. And so if you're married and, and you're getting it from there, I think again, back to the communication, having more open communication, why you want to make a change, how you want to do it. Um, maybe taking smaller steps. Maybe it's, you know, you start with your fitness or, or something to give yourself more energy. I don't know. It, it's, I received it a lot. I was in a flat spot and I read sovereignty and that actually woke me up to some different things that I just started working on. You know, it, even if it was as simple as being a little more proficient in firearms, right. Or maybe getting into jujitsu or whatever it was, right. Just baby steps of starting to get into things that made me better. And that trickled into every other part of my life. And, um, you know, my wife's very supportive of a lot of things, but even she was kind of like, really, are you going to do that? Like, we don't have enough things that we're doing already. You're going to add more stuff to it. And now she's really grateful that we did. And, and so, cause she's um, seen the fruit of that work of that labor. Exactly. Right. It's she's, she's seen a leadership shift, you know, all kinds of different things, me being more excited for things, getting more done, being more efficient, whatever it is. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to prove it. Um, but you can't just prove it in spite of, you know, you have to gain support through, through that proof and do it little by little. If you try and do too much at once, that's where the bigger backlash comes from. Um, I'm trying to think of this, this book, the dream giver. Um, I think Bruce Wilkinson, I think is the author of the dream giver. Um, it's a great short, easy read. Um, and it's a parable about a guy 
man, I'm, I'm going to mess it up. I'm not going to try, but look it up, The Dream Giver. And it tells the story of a guy who's trying to uh, become somebody, mm. you know, and, and do something different. And they, they have all these funny little names, you know, like dream stealers, you know, that show up when you yeah. start trying to pursue your dream and things like that. But I think that that's helpful um, in helping you understand like all those things, all of the negative things that happen to you when you try and make a positive change are normal. Yeah. And they happen to everybody. Yeah, maybe don't don't make it so wrong that you get pushed back. The the other antidote maybe is, um, or, or maybe word of caution. Don't do it for them. That's the yeah. other thing too, because I I think sometimes even if it's in spite of something, we'll be like, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to convince them. They're going to see me this way, man. Like th- that's that's a covert contract, and it's outside of your control. So whatever it is that you're working on, make sure that you're doing it for you, that you're committed to it. The results and your growth that you will have will, will be a natural byproduct of you succeeding. And that will help their adoption of what you're doing, but don't do it to win them. Don't do it to change their perspective of you. Don't do it that way. Cause that's not, that's never going to be satisfying enough, or they may not agree. And, and you have to be okay with like, Hey, I'm committed to this because I want to get in shape and maybe they don't give a crap whether you're in shape or not. And, and it's got to be something that, um, that moves and inspires you and that you're committed to for yourself. Um, not, you know, a, as a covert contract to change someone else's perspective. And most people are fine with just being average and ordinary uh, things being the same. They actually prefer it that way because it's yeah. easier. It's easy. And so if you don't think that way, you can expect that the majority of people are going to give some resistance to that. But like you said, just keep focusing on your wins and, uh, and build it up slowly over time. And, and most likely um, they'll get on board as that, uh, as you becoming better helps to serve them as well. But I think you nailed it, you know, with making sure that you're doing it for you, that it's what yeah. you want. Nick Taylor, when someone asks for advice, yet they are really only looking for uh, looking to validate their decisions they've already made, what approach would you guys find appropriate to get through these get through to these individuals? I mean, it, you have to leave it on them and not on you. I, I think too many yeah. people get caught up with trying to change people. Yep, and um, where all you could do is teach correct principles and, and hope that they govern themselves, you know, through that. Um, but don't stop teaching those principles is what I would say, you know, keep at it and then simultaneously be an example of what works. And that's your best chances of helping them to change. Um, but you know, you, you can't change people that aren't, aren't ready, you know, but if you keep teaching, saying the same things, being that example, maybe you catch them at the right time, right? Timing is everything. I, I used to hear this in my business from actually from Ed Milet. He used to tell us that when you're talking to somebody and you're passionate about what you do and you want them to understand it um, and they're, they don't want any part of it, one of two things is usually happening. Either they don't understand what you're saying or the timing's not right. And so, you know, most people are pretty poor at articulating uh, a philosophy or a way of doing things, or even a, a feeling that's worked for them. And so, yeah, maybe a lot of times people don't get it, but I think more than that is the timing issue. You know, if people aren't ready to change, it doesn't matter what you tell them. Right. And so if you, you default to one of those two things, you're not going to get too caught up in trying to change them. And you just, keep doing your thing, keep applying the principles, keep telling, you know, them those principles and, and hopefully it catches them at the right time eventually. Yeah. All right. Timo uh, Mueller, how to stay on track with the battle plan during vacations. It is mere, is it merely adapting tactics so that they fit into the day or are there other tips and tricks that one could apply? So staying on the path during the holidays or during vacations. I think it's circumstantial, um, yeah. you know, because if you're on vacation and it, part of your plan is probably going to have to do with business. Disconnect, you mean? Yeah. And, and sometimes you, 
you're not maybe, you know, maybe part of your business plan is, you know, I'm making a hundred calls a day or whatever it is. And, you know, if you're in sales, it's sales calls, maybe it's, you know, client calls or whatever. Um, but if you're on vacation, maybe necessarily you're not going to do the hundred. Right. And so kind of unpack the things that you can still do to keep your habits strong. You know, most of that probably revolves around your fitness and those sorts of things. I think that's, that gets most people, they go on a vacation and they just don't do anything that they normally do. And then afterwards they're like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Right. And, yeah. and they feel like they let themselves down, but if you just commit to one or two of the four quadrants, right. Or, or whatever it is, and you nail those ones, then you can still feel good. So I think it's, you don't have to get every single thing done. Um, but making sure that you commit to the couple, you know, you can achieve while you're on vacation and nailing those. Yeah. Well, and, and I think a lot of us, it, it adds to the vacation, you know, like I, I remember, um, years back, I was training for a marathon and went on vacation, you know, was at Disneyland for the week. Well, I just got up at 4.00 AM and got my runs in mm. and guess what? It felt great. Like I felt great. Like I, I felt good that I got my runs in while still on vacation. Like, so, so far too often, right? Like, I think we're like, oh, it's vacation is like the, the ultimate excuse, you know, not to do something. I would ask uh, Timo is, would you feel better if you actually still did your tactics while on vacation? And for a lot of us, the answer would be, yeah, I'd actually feel great if I still did those things. So do them and don't use the, don't use the vacation as the excuse, right? Be a little bit unreasonable with yourself and and kind of do what's crazy. Like I, I've been on vacation in the past where I I've been in Europe and I had team calls at like, I don't know, like 3 AM in the morning, mm -hmm. like kind of some crazy stuff. And I'm like, guess what? I didn't regret it right after the call. I didn't regret it. I thought, man, this was great. Like, I'm glad I did that. So, um, you know, but in the same breath, like back to what you're, maybe the idea is to be on vacation, right. And, and to decompress and to get away from work and other things. And so, you know, just make sure that you're not using vacation as the excuse, I think is ultimately what I'm hearing. Yeah. And if you keep it in front of you, if you're reading it and you've chosen those things to keep reading every single day, you're going to find the places to fit those things in. I think, um, yeah. you know, as you mentioned the run, I thought of, we went to Mexico when COVID started the first time. And we were there and my wife and I were sitting out by the pool and the kids were doing their thing. They started this like water aerobics class thing, you know? And I was like, look how ridiculous. Literally the instructor was, you ever see the movie, The Proposal? Yeah. And the dude, the like, the like stripper guy, you know who I'm talking about? Like in that movie, <laughs> like, like he, he, he was kind of like the, the town, like entertainer, right? Yeah. This, yeah. this dude leading this looked just like that guy and acted <laughs> like him. So I was like cracking up, but I'm like, okay, I could sit here and watch or let's do it, you know, and then yeah. we'll get our workout in. And it was hard. And it was, you know, it, we might've looked ridiculous, but it ended up being a highlight for us. Cause we just had so much fun we felt silly, but we got our workout in and it was, it was finding it in that day. Right. It didn't, yeah. it, it was there in front of us. We had the ability to do it. And honestly, if I hadn't been reading that part of my plan and looking for the places where I could get it in, I would have missed that opportunity. Totally. Yeah. We've done, we do that when we've gone to the lake where we had unconditional workouts. And so we at like probably nine, nine AM, we grab all the kids. We're at the lake. We set up stations on the grass with some resistance bands, a pull-up bar, <laughs> an area to do burpees or whatever. We, we enlist all the kids and you're like, all right, we're doing, we're doing, um, you know, circuits, you know, we'll set a timer. Ended up being like a family event with, with nephews and nieces. Great time was had by all. That wouldn't have been possible if we didn't make that a priority. So yeah. it's like, you know, just make it a priority. It, it, Vacation is going to be fine, I think. Anyway. So, all right, John Jenkinson, what are the best strategies to use to stay connected and keep open communication with your daughter as she enters her teen years? My daughter has naturally gravitated towards my wife. So, Sean, do you have a daughter and uh, how old? 16. So oh, it's it's it. right in the wheelhouse. <laughs> My oldest is 11. So I'm kind of like, I don't know how this is going to, I mean, I have an idea of what I'm planning on doing, but yeah. 
talk to this us. Is, yeah, I'm right in the middle of it, you know, and, and um, she's our oldest. And, um, and then she's also very high energy, you know, she's diagnosed with ADHD at a young age and, you know, a lot of these different things. And so like through the teenage years, it's almost made it a little more difficult in some ways, Mm -hmm. but what I've done is, um, find the places to connect and where where that's, yeah. And where that happened a lot, where now she has a driver's license, but before she did making sure that I was the one that was teaching her to drive. Um, and so while we're driving around and I'm teaching her and helping her, we had tons of conversation, you know, and so just finding that, um, and then that, that turned into finding it in other ways. Now I'm involved with, you know, just her friends as she's, uh, going out different places. I, 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 I insert myself in a conversation, which at first was hard because she was resisting it. She didn't want to talk to me about stuff, but the more, normal I made it the easier it got and then getting interested in things that she's interested in even if I think it's ridiculous right like like lately she's wanted um shoes right she's gotten into like the air force ones and the and the retro jordans and stuff like that and so so like she she took an old pair and she repainted them and made them look really cool uh, like custom ones Um, She got the shoe paint and all this stuff and she's super into it. And so I just, I went in there while she's doing it. I'm like, man, just, just complimenting her. And, and it was, it was genuine and, and finding, you know, all of her strengths, like, man, you're so creative. You're so involved. Look, when you're really into something, look how good of a job you do. Look how focused you are. I'm so proud of you, man. That turned out awesome. You know, and she's, it just became a little thing that, she's excited to tell me about now because I showed excitement in something that she's doing. And so again, whether it's her friends and what, I mean, here we are looking to move right. And into another state. So obviously she's not happy about that. This could be a really tense time where she just doesn't want to talk to us. And so instead of letting it be tense or instead of letting her be angry about things, it's finding, you know, ways to talk to her about those things and what she's, upset about some of the positives of moving what it's going to be some things that could help her feel better about the move what are some you know what if if she had her ideal thing in a new house what would it be and and you know we'll make sure we look for that and in where we're looking and whatever and not just her with all the kids but especially with her as a 16 year old girl and now moving away from her friends um it's just making myself a little more uncomfortable and seeking that converse conversation. And it's a lot of effort because they resist, you know? And, and so it's, uh, but it, I think what's worked the best is putting her in situations where she can't go anywhere. And that's usually driving around. Um, when she gets in trouble, if she like loses her phone or, or she's lost her car privileges a few times, I volunteer to be the one to drive her to work. She works at Chick-fil-A, <laughs> right? And so I'll drive her, I'll pick her up. I'll, and it's really just this. so you can get some nuggets. Yeah. So we can hang out <laughs> so we can talk. So yeah, exactly. Get some nuggies and, and an Oreo shake. Right. Um, but yeah, that it's, it's, it's more than any of that. It's, it's putting myself in a position where she's stuck with me and, and we start having those conversations. I don't let her be on her phone. I, you know, I talk to her or she's on her phone. Hey, what are you looking at? You know, what are you? Yeah. And she, sometimes she'll show me it, if it's TikTok or whatever, which I think is just makes us you stupider. Right. And, but I'll, I'll laugh at some of it, but then I'll also have some conversation. Like, why do people think that's funny? Why do people think that's okay? Like, do you think that just made you smarter or less smart watching that? Right. Like, yeah. like, why is that viral? Why do people, why are people so interested in watching that? And, you know, and what are some other things that you could do that are more productive? And, and again, it could be in one ear and out the other. But honestly, I see it making a difference. I see her being more proactive and, in, in, you know, finding things that serve her more. But if I didn't insert myself in a conversation with her at this point, hundreds of times, um, it's, there'd be a giant gap, you know, in our communication for sure. Got it. All right. Grant Grenzwig, I'm going to be a dad for the first time, and it was largely unexpected. What and where should I be focusing my time and energy in order to be prepared and continually lead my new family effectively as possible? 
Um, this, in my opinion, is, I don't think two make is harder than one. I think a lot of people think it is. I think three was way harder than two. Right. And so I, I don't think two is much different, but no matter what, with each kid, one of the places I think I see parents fail is they focus more on the kids than the relationship with their spouse. Yeah. Or themselves. Um, I, th- I would add to. Yeah. Or themselves, yeah. you know, trying to get their free time their you know, their, yeah. their things um, instead of putting more work and effort into the open lines of communication with their spouse. Um, and so regardless of how many kids you have or what gets added, if your lines of communication are, are working well with your partner, then, um, you can work through any of the kids stuff. And I see too many people just focus on the kids and they get so focused on the kids that they forget to pour more love on each other. And that breaks down that relationship, you know, which long-term, if that relationship gets affected, um, then that's going to be a detriment to the kids. So that'd be my biggest advice is make sure you're still doing date nights. You're still, you know, focusing on time and attention with, with your spouse and not just diving into doing everything for the kids. Yeah. And the only thing I'd add is make sure you're taking care of yourself, yeah. right? That your health is solid, that uh, your mindset is solid uh, and that you're showing up in a very effective and honorable way. Um, and that's going to allow you to be in a position to, to serve your children and your spouse. Um, you, you just can't overlook those two things. I don't think you know, taking care of yourself and and a solid relationship with mom. Totally agree. Yeah. All right. Chris Moser, I've had custody of my oldest for almost two years. He's eight. He has ADHD and a very destructive nature. He also has a lot of boundary issues. How can I channel these things into something positive? I'm having trouble getting through to him. That's going to be... A normal part of having a kid with ADHD, honestly. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for us, one of the things, school was really difficult. So I don't know if he's homeschooling or if he's in school. One thing we did for our daughters, we found a school that catered to her personality type where they didn't make her sit at a desk because that was near impossible, especially when yeah. she was younger, um, where they let her literally, if she wanted to lay under her desk and do her work, they let her do it. You know, if she wanted to go sit in a beanbag and do it they did it. Now those places are harder to find, you know, and maybe it costs a little more or whatever else. But for us, it was an investment in her future, you know, instead of her being the bad kid at school, um, she thrived and she did well. Um, you know, when COVID came, she was in a regular high school that helped her adjust to being in a regular school so that by the time she got to high school, she was able to do it. And then COVID hit and it was way too distracting for her to do it online with, you know, 40 other kids. Um, and she, there was a quick downhill. And so we, you know, immediately put her into another private school that was more, that was one-on-one learning. Um, so it cost more, it was harder, it was more work, but for her, we had to do it, you know, on the home front, it was understanding that again, she can't control some of the things that she's doing. So if he's being destructive or whatever else, we just started to build things that maybe she could even destroy. Right. Or um, that aggression out. Yeah. Get the aggression out, get the energy out. Um, There's just such an abundance of energy with kids like that. Um, Changing her diet was a major thing that helped a lot of it um, suppress a lot of it and open up some of her sensory processing issues and changing her diet. Maybe, you look into that as well, you know, instead of a a lot of parents just try and medicate their kids. Um, I'll be honest, it's, it's hard. It's a lot more work. Um, but, but work, you know, put in the extra effort. Um, I think the biggest key is just try not to make them a bad kid, Yeah, you know, understand that it's not, they're not trying to be bad. They're really having trouble processing different sensory things. Um, try and understand it you know, try and hold back your emotion when it happens. Um, and then try and nurture some of the things that'll help get that energy out. Yeah. 
One thing that I would suggest is um, Warren Farrell's book, The Boy Crisis. Um, he, he has an entire chapter on ADHD and natural ways to, to help uh, deal with it. Um, and and I, you're, you're going to have to come to this conclusion on your own. Um, but according to Dr. Farrell, the majority of ADHD kids are actually improperly diagnosed too. So yeah. be careful not to jump on that bandwagon too quickly. You know what I mean? When, when reality, we're talking about dopamine management, right? And, um, you know, we live in a society where I think, you know, it's just going to constantly get increased, right? Where, where everything is instant gratification, right? Everything is, nothing is delayed gratification anymore. Um, if I'm bored, I grab my phone. If I don't have something to do, I watch TV. It's always stimulus after stimulus after stimulus. And that looks, and I'm not saying it is, that looks like ADHD. Because mm. we get to the point where we're like, oh, we can't just sit and think. And, and everything's instant dopamine dumps constantly that, that we're looking for. I mean, we, our generation is doing it, let alone other kids. And, and some of the stuff in that book is like, it would blow your mind, right? Like, so for instance, a lot of what we do as children is a result of, of getting a hit of dopamine. So when you do something good and mom and dad goes, good job, little Timmy, you're, you know, such a good kid. You're so kind. I get a dopamine dump for that. Right. And, and we get these habits that get formed. That little feel good of mom and dad approves me that amount of dopamine versus the dopamine that I get from watching like a cartoon, they don't even compare. We are, we are fighting to get our kids to be conditioned against things that they almost have no chance to deal with yeah. because of the amount of excitement and dopamine that they're getting from all this other stimulus. So grab that book, read that chapter on ADHD, he even talks about, you know, if they actually are diagnosed with ADHD, even some strategies around, you know, natural treatments, you know, and et cetera. And so I, I would just be mindful and, and, and really realize what, what is ADHD um, versus what is not. Uh, and, and I think far too often, I think a lot of parents are probably jumping the gun a little bit, you know what I mean, with that diagnose um, of their children. So. Kind of keep yeah. That. And, and just as you were saying that, I also thought on the destructive end, um, maybe get them into jujitsu, right? Yeah, At eight totally. years old, that's a great time. And yeah. uh, man, he'll get a lot of that, channel that energy. That, yeah, yeah. Channel it in a, in a positive way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. All right. Andrew Noel, how do you assess whether a long-term relationship, not yet a marriage is worth continuing when it hasn't been going well? A little bit of background. We have been dating for about three years. She has two kids who I absolutely love, but we are finding that we are very different people. We both say we want to work things out and put effort into it, but we always seem to fall back into old patterns and treat each other in ways that hurt. We have both broken each other's trust, lied some, and we aren't sure how to move forward, even though we both love each other. I'm scared that the answer might just be move on but I don't want to give up, even though it has been a rough couple of years. There's a lot of good, but it is a roller coaster. The highs are very high, but the lows can be completely crippling. I just, I think of, uh, you know, I don't know which one it was, but the podcast that Ryan did about the red flags. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much all of them right here, right? It is, uh, you know, it, it's, if it's not getting better and if you've really honestly worked on making it better to this point, um, I don't think it's going to honestly, you know, and, and I hate giving that advice and without knowing them and their personalities or anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, but if, if I think what stood out to me the most is that they've both broken each other's trust. Um, you know, it, it's, that's a hard one when you're already in a good relationship and committed to each other and working on it. Well, um, you know, let alone if you're not right. And I think the hard part here is if she has kids that you love, uh, what I see anyways, in this situation, a lot of times is that attachment is more towards those kids. You don't want to let them down. 
you know, where they now don't have obligation. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and that attachment keeps you in a bad situation. Um, you know, but I think three years is a long enough amount of time to, to know. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if you think the same or what your thoughts are, but that's just kind of, yeah. I mean, I struggle with this, right. Because you don't want to give that advice, right? Like, Hey, give up, you know? And, and I think far too often the natural, the typical case is we give up too early. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is, is Andrew giving up early? Did he really give it a good run? Um, so I, I would just really get clear. Yeah, obviously we're not going to, we don't know, right. We don't know enough details. We don't know them. Yeah. Um, but I, I would get clear in regards to why your, your why's like, why did you ruin the trust? Why do you guys come constantly, um, have conflict and have these lows, like get really clear on how you're showing up. And the meaning that you're adding to maybe her actions that may not be necessarily truth, but your interpretation, like I I would get clear in that space. Why? Because you're going to do the same damn thing in the next relationship if you're not clear on those. So fix that shit now. If, if, if there's something to be fixed. So I, I don't know if there is, but you know, the probability is I think most relationships are difficult because of the baggage we bring into the relationship. And so I would suggest that you look at your baggage and figure out how that's affecting how you show up as, as a spouse or a partner here um, and how that disrupts your guys' relationship. That way you can fix that at least, <laughs> confirm that it, it, it's still not good enough or have that fixed. So then that way, when you, when you do consider like, you know, whether you step away or not, that you've, you've grown from this. So if you're not a better man, like Andrew, if you decide, Hey, it's not worth it. And you walk away. If you're not a better person after you walk away, then this has been a complete waste of your time. So don't make it a waste of your time. Become a better man for having dated, dated this woman and for, uh, internalizing and and growing, uh, into a better person because of it. I like that. Tough though. Super tough. tough. All right. Isaac, uh, Goble. Maybe this has been asked before. Uh, you know what? This is a a Ryan specific question. So we're going to skip. Sorry, Isaac. We'll, We'll pull you up next time. All right, uh, Sam Broadway, if somebody wants to make a change in their life, but doesn't believe in themselves to succeed, how can you inspire them to have faith in the process? (laughs) Is this one of those asking for a friend? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's uh, uh, doesn't believe in themselves, you but they want to change. I'm going to approach this with the assumption that he's, you know, trying to help somebody else. Um, and, uh, actually we can hit it both ways and maybe he's the one that needs that help. I think you need to find their gifts and Mm. tell them what they are on a regular basis, Mm. um, to give them small wins that they maybe don't see in themselves and actually not, maybe they probably don't see in themselves. Yeah. Um, and it, it has to be genuine it has to be true about them you can't just make it up like hey kip you you know you're so outgoing i'll call bs you know whatever right um it has to be true um point it out um make a point to find the things that they're doing well or doing right um you know so that they can so that they can feel good about themselves and their progress and maybe some of the things that they're getting better at um and then if it's yourself um, that's having that challenge. It's finding somebody that can do that for you, you know, whether it's a mentor, maybe it's a a good friend or, you know, somebody that can be like, Hey, will you just, you know, help me in this process. I'm trying to get better at X. Um, I don't feel like I'm doing it well, or I'm doing it right or making progress. Can you hold me accountable? And then also maybe, you know, point out, um, when I'm doing it well, um, cause I think too many times we focus on the negative and what we're doing wrong and trying to fix our, uh, the things that, um, our weaknesses when 
it's we're better off focusing on what we're doing right. And that builds those little wins um, that build our confidence towards us making larger changes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if faith and hope or confidence is a result of success, right? <laughs> Uh, we, you know, in the book that we're reading this month on our council, you know, if I remember correctly, one of the chapters, like he alludes to the fact that um, you have confidence that you know how to brush your teeth. Yeah. Why? Because you're good at it because you practice it enough you now. And we don't think about those things as like, oh, I have confidence. You yeah, actually you do. There's a bunch of stuff that we're all confident about, but it took reps to get good at it. Um, and, and something I, I've shared with my son, my oldest son, Brendan, you know, we're, we were t- t- talking about like mental fortitude and, and having a stronger mental fortitude. And my question to him was, um, how are you practicing mental fortitude? Do you wake up when you don't want to? Do you work out even though you don't want to? Do you put in the extra rep? Like, and the answer to, you know, from him was like, no. Well, then why do you assume that you're going to be mentally strong? Hmm. Like, it's no different than anything else. You got to practice whatever that is, right? And, and su- success can be found in a number of different ways. And, and far too often in Iron Castle, I mean, we use this as an analogy all the time. I, I already know what Ryan would say to this. Start working out. That's what you tell this person. Hey, yeah, it doesn't have any self-confidence. Not sure you can succeed. Start working out. Because that's the easiest way, an outward way to, to generate momentum to actually do something. We feel good when we do something that is difficult and we like accomplish it and we overcame it. Working out is one of the easiest things you could do to do that. So Sam, my answer would be start working out every day, go for a run every day for this individual. And they will actually start getting confidence in themselves and their capability to do hard things. But if you're never doing hard things, you're never going to have the confidence to do them. So maybe a couple of resources like Atomic Habits comes to mind. What other resources come to mind? What's our book of the month that we're, The Confidence, the confidence Gap? Gap? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really good. Another good book. I, I've actually really enjoyed The Confidence Gap. So yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, just get on the path and, and start making progress and look for those easy wins, right? Yeah. Um, and, and maybe focus on habits and triggers and all that kind of stuff to, you know, kind of hijack the process. The other thing well, is I, I have to actually add one more thing in, in we do what we're committed to. We, we talk about this, uh, at my work all the time. We, we say that our culture is a culture of accountability, which a culture of accountability is an environment by which all team members are trusted to be, bring their best work to the table, self-directed to do so. Yeah. Accountability isn't me riding Sean saying, hey, Sean, why don't you get your stuff done? No, no, it's Sean actually doing it, having self-discipline and being self-directed. So how does one get self-directed? Their commitment level to what it is that they're working on. And so then you might ask yourself, well, then Kip, how does one get committed? First, I would say, whatever it is that you're working on. So, and Sam, we don't know if you're talking about you <laughs> or, or someone else, but I would say, is this individual, you said they, um, they want to make a change in their life. Is that change so clear to them that they're moved, touch and inspired? And so I'd be asking the reason, I'd be asking the question, why? Why do they want to change in their life? And their why may be weak. Ah, you know, I want to be, you know, I just want to, you know, be more like, not strong enough. Most likely it's weak. Yeah, it's weak. They need to get super clear why they want to change their life. Guaranteed. Once that's strong enough, all of us will change. But it may not be strong enough for them. Right? Maybe they have to hit rock bottom or they need to get way more clever and clear in regards to why their commitment to change is so critical. And we're all a little bit different, right? But we, I I would challenge, figure out what that is. And so much that it drives in the the term I like to use is that they're moved, touch and inspired. If they're moving, touch and inspired by why they need to make a change and they're committed to it. Now it's just execution. Yeah. I had one last thought too, that, um, 
help them be cognizant of their environment. Um, mm-hmm. Because if they're in a, it drag they're, them they're, down. Yeah. yeah. If they're in a bad environment, you know, yeah. you look at most corporate jobs, right. They just focus on your weakness. They tell you what you're not doing right. They'll, you yeah. know, you could go a thousand days of never being late and they, they never praise you for that. And the first day you show up late, then they're all over you. Right. And yeah, that's the yeah. only time you get recognized is when you do something wrong. And um, I thought about this the other day, cause we're starting baseball out here by us. And I'm going to be coaching my boys and you, we have these coaches interviews, you know, and they ask you, I've been coaching like seven or eight years now. And, um, and every time I think of, they ask, you know, why, what do you think makes you a good coach? And, and my answer is always, I just, I focus on the positive with the boys that I coach. I'm not the guy that's out there telling them what they did wrong. And I, I look at like, there's so many kids, you know, I have a son who's 13 now and all the best kids that were in his league when he was small, almost none of them play anymore because they got onto these better teams. They were naturally really good at it, but because those teams are so competitive and their coaches are so competitive, they tend to yell at them the whole time and they don't want to play anymore, you know, because they're just in this negative environment. So here you have kids that are naturally really talented and really good at something that just don't want to do it because they, they, maybe they don't think, they're that good at it because all they hear is their flaws in this thing, even though they're exceptional. Right. And so environment has a lot to do with that where, you know, maybe you need to shake that up too, to put yourself in a position, you know, it doesn't mean you quit your job or whatever else, but just place yourself in places that are going to um, help you focus on more of the good. Yeah. Who are you banding with, you know, what your circle of influence? Yeah, absolutely. Good point. All right, Jason Smith, I live in California in a more conservative area. I know Sean did as well. I love living close to our family, being established in my church and building a community. Do you think with the uh, exemplary leadership and change, California can can be a place of more neutrality and sanity again? Or do you think it's far too gone and we will need to leave to get a suitable environment for our families? (laughs) I've really struggled with this one. And um you know, my Especially wife with I, you starting off today with, uh, yeah, we want to get out of California. <laughs> yeah. And here's the thing we do and we don't, I love it yeah. here. I love where we live. We live like he's talking about. We live in this nice little pocket. It's a little more conservative. We have great friends. We, you know, it's almost like the sandlot, our neighborhood, you yeah. know, the kids ride their bikes anywhere they want. We don't worry about them. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Um, you know, and, and could strong leadership come in and really make a change in California Yes, but it's going to take a long time. Um, you know, Joe Rogan posted a, a thing today that showed about all these trains getting uh, hijacked in LA right now. They're literally really? guys are jumping onto trains at the at the train station where after they've loaded from the docks, and they're jumping on with bolt cutters. Like passenger oh, trains? No, no, they're, they're like uh, cargo, cargo trains. Okay, so they're jumping on with bolt cutters. They're, they're cutting off the locks, opening up these crates and literally just pulling whatever they want out of these things and anything they don't want, they just throw on the tracks. If you just look it up on Joe Rogan's thing, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, and that's one thing I didn't know was happening, but you look at the homeless thing, you look at, I mean, there's just so many things happening in California that are so far down this road, you know, and and all the guys that are getting caught doing these things, they're getting a slap on the hand and they're back out on the street the next day, you know? Yeah. And, and so that's all because of policy here. So yeah, could someone come in and start to clean that up and whatever else? Yeah. Um, like that happened in New York, right? With, um, with uh, oh my gosh, I'm spacing out. Oh, back in the nineties? Uh, yeah. Who came in there? Why Giuliani. In Giuliani, right? Yeah. But it took 10 years, right? I mean, it it took a long, long time um, to clean it up. And then now it's a mess and then some again, right? And so, yeah, it could. Um, But are you going to keep somebody with that type of leadership in California for that long? I don't know, you know, and and so it's you could tough it out and, uh, you know, kind of test your fortitude um, or put yourself in a place that gives you, you and your family, its best chances, you know? And so there's too many things trickling in that I see already in our home. And that's, what's gotten us to want to move. 
I could create you're having to sacrifice your, your kids by staying possibly. Yeah. And again, it, it's, and some people might say, well, you know, be tougher, have more fortitude, you know, work harder. Um, or we could give our family its best chances generationally by, you know, being somewhere else that's, that has the environment and the policies and everything else that we'd rather. And I'm not thinking even just myself or my kids, I'm thinking grandkids and their grandkids, what's going to give them their best chances of happiness. You know, we talked about the plan of happiness before and, and, yeah. and, uh, the, the nuclear family. Um, so that's our thought process, right? What's going to give us our best chances. So yeah. Could we come back? Absolutely. Um, do I want to bank on it at this point? Not anymore. Right. That's just me personally. All right. Nathan Blaser, two questions. First, what are some helpful tools to channel focus at times when you can't focus on tasks at hand, especially one that you know needs to be completed? And then second, what are some keys to developing into a person who's consistently put themselves in the best positions to win? Kind of related question a little bit, but. Yeah. And it, it goes to Atomic Habits. Um, also, The Power of Habit is another book. They, they basically teach very similar principles. Deep work, I would say. I would add deep work to this list. Yeah. And, and for me personally, I'm not a structured guy. So yeah. it's, I, I think you're probably more of a structured guy naturally. Yeah. I'm not. Um, and so I need things in place that are going to help me be more structured. One of those things is at night, um, assessing what needed to get done that maybe didn't and making those priorities for the next day. This is also um, the, the seven habits of highly effective people, right? Covey yep. um, is along those lines as well. Uh, finding the most important things for the next, next day, making a list. If I don't have a list, I'm, I'm distracted and all over the place and making sure I'm getting those things done. Um, using the battle plan, the battle planner is a good tool to keep me focused on those four most important things and making sure I'm, I'm ticking off my, my daily tactics. Um, you know, and so the combination of those things are tools that have worked for me, not being a very structured person. Um, and then just the consistency of focus on what I'm trying to achieve and what's important to me, that why you were talking about you know, that being strong enough to, to keep me on the path of focus, but, um, you know, where I used to just kind of default go to, well, I'm just not organized. And that was my excuse. Um, so I had to take away that excuse and start getting more organized and then finding what worked for me. Right. I had a physical planner. I used to use the Franklin Covey planners for a lot of years. And then that changed into some other planners. Now I use my phone, you know, for scheduling things and reminders and, and things like that, um, that keep me on track. Um, the battle planner I use, I started using the app and, and now I use a combination of the app with the reminders for the, from the battle planner app. It gives me yeah. little reminders at night to, to make sure I double check my stuff, but then the physical battle planner, you know, and looking at those physically every day and writing stuff down actually works better than just pulling them up in the app for me. So it's kind of a combination of the two, right? So and those are some tools I use. And then knowing myself well enough, you know, figuring myself out well enough to figure out what's going to work best. And I found that's kind of the combination of different things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't add much. I mean, calendar tasks, um, you know, focus, uh, I, I would time box it at least, so if there's something that you don't want to do, literally put it on your calendar, like, okay, at noon, I have 30 minutes to do task X or whatever, and, and give it your all. And when the 30 minutes are up, stop working on it. So I, I would give yourself some deadlines in regards to what that looks like. And, you know, it's amazing what happens when, you know, something needs to be done and it, I have a follow-up meeting and I schedule a follow-up meeting and I'm like, all right, got to get done before that meeting. Right. And, and it's amazing what we can accomplish when, um, when we have limited time, uh, you know, people get super focused and, and you can accomplish a great deal of things. So I, I would create that into your environment, right. So you can have moments of super focus. And like Sean said, you know, 
know yourself, you know, uh, I can't do this with the TV on. Oh, no brainer. Don't mm. work in front of the TV, right? Mm. Like do things that, you know, um, are going to work and avoid the temptations of the typical distractions that you're going to get at our job. We have these busy lights that we put on our desks. If it's purple, that means no one walks up to me. Zero. No one can talk to me when that light's purple. That's our busy light. That's my deep focused work light. That way we're kind of honoring each other. And so you might even need to enlist people, right? Like, Hey, when honey, when I'm in the office and the doors locked or closed, that's like, I'm deep work. So look at that book, uh, Cal Newport, deep work, seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey. What's the other ones that we power of habit, power um, of habit. Yeah. So I, I would, I would get some resources in the yeah, last atomic thing, habits, atomic habits. That's right. And the last question you had is like keys to developing a person who's consistently put themselves in the best position to win, win in the position you're in. That's how. Whatever it is, whatever your lot is right now, are you winning? Are you killing it? That's how you put your in the best, yourself in the best position to continue to win, is win with whatever's been handed to you right in the moment. Yeah. And the, you mentioned the distractions. You know, I thought of like a lot of the schools, they have these little um, pouches that the kids have to put their phones in when they go into class so that they don't have that distraction, right? It's hung up. Maybe you have to do that at home, you know, and, yeah. and get rid of those things. Um, maybe you need to literally get rid of your TV. You yeah. know, I, I didn't have a TV for six years. Um, yeah. just got rid of it because I didn't want to have even the ability to walk in the room and turn it on. Yeah. Our TV's um, downstairs in a room, which Asia and I will never walk down to turn on. <laughs> <laughs> Thus we never watch TV. Yeah. So put those systems in place that remove distractions and you know, and, and help you to stay more focused. Yeah. Okay. Last question, Abe Garcia, this is a quick one. So I want to throw it in before we wrap up. Um, okay. Hear me out. He says, what do you think of an in-house order of man, IC BJJ tournament <laughs> or a battle team BJJ tag team matches, maybe at least at the order of man jujitsu camp or at origin. So I actually brought this up to Ryan and he's like, Hey, if we get enough guys that are coming to origin next year, yeah, we'll make the arrangements. And we'll make it happen. So, um, you know, maybe we'll pull some, uh, Ryan will pull some strings and we'll get some mat dedicated mat time for, uh, for an in-house, uh, iron council order man tournament. So, um, so there you go. Yeah, Abe, it's, it's on the list. I, I think the key thing is we get a big enough group going to, uh, origins immersion camp, you know, we can make anything happen. So, all right, Sean, uh, sh I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. So uh, a couple things. We mentioned the Iron Council. If you guys want to join us, um, we'll probably have openings at the beginning of March. Um, but to know when those openings happen, uh, you need to connect with us. And so you can connect with Mr. Mickler on Instant uh, and Twitter, at Ryan Mickler. That's M-I-C-H-L-E-R. As well as go to orderman.com slash Iron Council. Sign up for the newsletter so you get properly notified uh, when we open that up. And as always, if you want to get your order of man swag, visit the store um, at store.orderofman.com. What else have we talked about? Battle planner. Battle planner. Yep. So you can get the battle planner app on your mobile phone by going to the number one, two week battle .com, Or you can also sign up for the battle ready program, which is a free 30 day program by going to orderofman.com slash battle ready. Good stuff. Good day, sir. Thank you guys. And until, uh, let's see, Friday field notes, take action and become the men you were meant to be. <laughs>